Indeed, all praise is due to Allah. We praise Him, seek His assistance, and ask His forgiveness. We praise Allah with sincerity for protecting us from harm, and we thank Him for all of His kindness and favors. Even if we made pens from all the trees and had ink as much as could fill the Tigris and Euphrates, we would still remain incapable of recording even the smallest amount of the praise we owe Allah for the abundance of His blessings. He is the first, last, most high, and the self-sufficient who has no needs. Thus, how could we ever enumerate all His favors? I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner. He unified the hearts of the people of Iman and He stated in His perfect revelation that He united their hearts. If you spent everything the earth contains, you would not have been able to bring their hearts together. However, Allah is the one who united them. I further bear witness that our Prophet Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and messenger. He urged us to adhere to the Quran and Sunnah and warned us against opposing them and becoming divided. May Allah grant an abundance of His commendation and protection to His Prophet as well as to the Prophet's family, noble companions, and all who continue to follow their path until the day when all people will be gathered. Servants of Allah, observe taqwa of your Lord and be grateful to Him for His innumerable blessings. This is necessary even though our gratitude cannot even match a small portion of what He has so generously granted us. Furthermore, how could gratitude ever equal the goodness extended by the one who bestows without reminding and gives without harming? Dear Muslims, our era is one in which trials of materialism have grown. Various doubts and forms of deviant thought have arisen. Many people have allowed their minds to go astray and they see the wrong things they do to be good and correct. There are those who have instigated disasters, battles, and wars in which blood has been shed, people have lost limbs, and innocent lives have been taken. There are even instances in which such things have resulted over a point of view a certain scholar might hold, or a legitimate difference of opinion regarding matters in which individual scholarly examination and reasoning can be exercised. In such instances of contention, each person involved says that only he is undoubtedly right. Allegiances are then formed because of viewpoints, and disavowals are made because of perspectives. In dealing with such situations, the brilliance of this religion shines through and its remarkable distinguishing features are manifested. Islam's directives and rulings are infused with care and kindness. They seek to nurture harmony, unity, brotherhood, and compassion. Those are critical ethical bonds between individuals that are to be fostered. Islam's teachings of moderation encourage them and its rulings and objectives emphasize them. That holds true even in cases of differing and in fact Islam's teachings seek to limit channels leading to contention. Allah the Most Exalted said, you must all firmly adhere to the Quran and Sunnah and you must not be divided among yourselves. Dear people of Iman, there are times when differing may be praiseworthy and that is because it is part of the universal laws that Allah decreed. Allah who is perfect in every way said, if your Lord willed, He would most certainly unite all people upon the truth. However, He did not decree that. Thus, differences will remain between people except those who submit to Allah's guidance, worship Him alone, or follow His messengers. Allah made people differ out of His infinite wisdom. Al-Hasan al-Basri, may Allah have mercy upon him, commented that this means Allah created people with the propensity to differ. However, differing can also be an evil which leads to contention, disputes, and corruption. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, pointed out that one facet of corruption which appears is what emanates from differences and divisions which oppose consensus and unity. That can lead to people disavowing one another and forming allegiances for reasons other than obeying Allah. That may even escalate to some people disparaging others, reviling them, and mocking them. Some may attack and fight against others. 
and some may boycott others to the extent that they would not pray behind others. All of these are among the gravest of matters which are prohibited by Allah and His Messenger. May Allah grant him commendation and protection. The esteemed scholar Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy upon him, remarked, the differences between people are inevitable due to the variations in their motives, understandings, and strength of comprehension. What is blameworthy is when people transgress against others as a result of that and become hostile. However, when differences occur but do not produce divisions and bigotry, and each party involved aims to obey Allah and His Messenger, there is no harm in such differences. My dear brothers in Islam, when one contemplates the history of the Muslim Ummah, he would notice that in the majority of cases, it remained occupied with differences among its individuals during times of laxity and non-essential intellectual pursuits. However, that disappeared when the Ummah faced any imminent surrounding danger or lurking enemy. At such times, the Ummah returns to being occupied with essentials and is keen to maintain internal unity in the face of any external enemy who follows an entirely different course. Not merely in facing others among themselves who may differ about mere viewpoints or relatively minor issues. Something else to be kept in mind is that when a person examines the differences that occur among the scholars of the Muslim Ummah, he must not neglect to distinguish between excusable differences in matters which are open to individual reasoning versus inexcusable differences in foundational matters which no Muslim should oppose or be ignorant of. The texts of Islam can be classified into four categories. One is the text whose authenticity and meaning are unequivocally established. This category is not open to differences, examination, or independent reasoning. Other categories are texts whose authenticity is established and meaning requires examination, whose authenticity and meaning require examination, and whose authenticity requires examination and meaning is established. These three categories are open to legitimate independent scholarly examination and reasoning. They are the realm in which minds vary and differences can occur, but within the framework of Islam's principles. Those principles unite rather than divide and bring together rather than separate. Maintaining a sound intention comes at the head of those principles. Anyone who examines differences between scholars of our Ummah must ensure that he intends to arrive at the truth as well as amend any mistakes while clarifying what is correct. Not disparage divergent viewpoints or make himself prominent. If someone is unable to maintain the foregoing intention, he should restrain himself from going further, which would contribute to the well-being of himself and the Ummah in general, and so as not to be restrictive concerning matters in which differences are acceptable. And Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, commented that certain lands of the East were among the causes of Allah sending the Tatars against the Muslims. Those lands were rife with divisions and turmoil between people based on schools of law and other matters as well. The individuals involved in such things are deserving of blame and punishment due to being people who are partisan towards falsehood, who follow conjecture, and who follow their own inclinations rather than guidance from Allah. In contrast to those maintaining unity and adhering to the Qur'an and Sunnah are among the foundations of the religion. The second principle is training oneself to return to the truth. Returning to the truth is always better than persisting in falsehood. A man once said to Ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, give me some comprehensive words of advice. Among the things Ibn Mas'ud told him were, whenever anyone brings the truth to you, accept it from him even if he is someone distant or whom you dislike. And whenever someone brings falsehood to you, do not accept it, even if he is someone near or whom you love. And Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy upon him, stated that it is necessary for a Muslim to follow the guidance of the Prophet, may Allah grant him commendation and protection, as it relates to accepting the truth, regardless of who it comes from, whether friend or foe, loved or despised, righteous or impious, and also rejecting falsehood, regardless of who it comes from. The third principle is that differences should be dealt with while bearing in mind that their occurrence is something to be expected from the very nature of human beings. Ali Imam al-Shatibi, may Allah have mercy upon him, commented that based on the wisdom of Allah, the most exalted, he decreed that the subsidiary matters of this religion be open to different perspectives and be a realm that accepts 
examination and reasoning. It is possible for mistakes to happen when scholars exercise independent examination and reasoning. And Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah hold that legitimate excuses are to be accepted in such cases. The minds of intellectuals may be harsh towards certain viewpoints, but their hearts must not be. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, remarked that scholars of the past would examine and discuss both theoretical and practical issues among themselves while maintaining harmony, unity, and brotherhood taught by the religion. If every two Muslims were to boycott each other whenever any difference arises, there would not remain any unity or brotherhood among Muslims as a whole. The fourth principle is giving due consideration to pertinent circumstances. In light of how far the Islamic world extended and how varied its communities became, differences arose in how issues were examined and how rulings were deduced. That led to differences in the way many of Islam's texts were explained, as well as differences in determining the rulings pertaining to unprecedented matters. Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah have mercy upon him, commented that fatwa, the response given to questions about religious matters, can vary based on variations in times, places, situations, environments, and circumstances. The fifth principle is dealing fairly with those who hold an opposing view. Allah who is perfect in every way said, People of Iman always uphold the truth, sincerely seeking to please Allah and remain fair when giving testimony. Do not let your dislike for a people cause you to be unfair to them. Rather, you must deal with them fairly. That is nearest to observing taqwa. You must continue to observe taqwa of Allah. Indeed, Allah is completely acquainted with everything that you do. Lacking fairness is a trait that would continue to separate between people even when they share the bond of kinship. There are two garments you must remove from yourself, since anyone dressed in them will end up blameworthy and disgraced. One is that of compounded ignorance, and the other is that of bigotry. Those two are awful garments to wear. Instead, you must adorn yourself with fairness. That is the finest of garments in which a person can clothe himself. And Imam al-Dhahabi, may Allah have mercy upon him, mentioned that Yunus al-Sadafi said, I never encountered anyone more intelligent than a shafi I debated with him one day about a certain matter, and then we parted. He later met me and said, Abu Musa, is it not all right for us to still remain brothers, even if we do not agree about a certain issue? This is the conduct to be observed when differences occur, and it fosters love and harmony. This is the way that the people of Islam should maintain their conduct when dealing with such matters. The sixth principle is that no disapproval can be made concerning issues open to independent scholarly examination and reasoning except when an authentic text of Islam is opposed. And Imam ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy upon him, stated that when it comes to such issues, if someone acts according to a view held by some of the scholars, he should not be censured or boycotted. If someone acts according to one of two legitimate views about a certain issue, he should not be censured. When there are two scholarly views about a given issue, and one of them appears to a person to be more accurate, he should act according to it. Otherwise, he should follow what is held by the scholars who are relied upon for clarifying which of the two views is more accurate. Shaykh al-Islam, may Allah have mercy upon him, also mentioned that when there is nothing established by the sunnah or scholarly consensus about a given issue, and there is room for independent scholarly examination and reasoning, a person should not be censured for acting in compliance with the view he holds as correct or if he follows a view held by dependable scholars. The seventh principle is that interaction should be based on what is apparent. This is because conjecture about people's hearts and intentions cannot be used as a basis for dealing with others. Therefore, when someone with a view that is divergent from yours says something consistent with the view you hold, that is to be accepted from him, even if you think he does not actually believe it to be correct. That applies as long as a person is not someone who believes that lying is permissible or necessary, in which case, what he says should be accepted with caution. Islam deals with people in this world based on what is apparent. As for what is concealed, that is entrusted to Allah. The eighth principle is to beware of praising oneself. When differing takes place regarding any given matter, one should not have the belief that what he does is unmistakably correct and that anyone with a divergent view is completely wrong. Who is there that has never been wrong? And who is there that is always right? Allah said, therefore do not praise yourselves. Allah has best knowledge about those who are genuine and observing taqwa. 
after Muslims have been affected by so much differing, division, splitting and disputation, has the time not come for them to take heed of Islam's pristine teachings? Differences about subsidiary issues must not be allowed to turn into a cause for disputes, divisions, accusations or aspersions about the motives of others. Today, we are in dire need of keeping our hearts clean to others. Allah told us that the supplication made by the people of Iman was our Lord. Do not place in our hearts rancor towards those who have Iman. Do not place in our hearts any rancor towards others who have Iman. Our Lord, you are certainly the bestow of mercy, the most kind. We are in dire need of uniting people's hearts, maintaining togetherness, and referring all our issues back to the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of His Prophet, may Allah grant combination of protection, and to the scholars of Islam who do what is correct. This is the course that we should follow when dealing with situations in which differences occur. Allah said, when the people receive information concerning public safety or fear, they spread it. However, had they referred to the messenger or those in authority over them, the people who were fit would have understood it and determined the correct course of action to take based on the information. And had it not been for Allah granting you His favor and mercy, you would have followed shaitan except for very few people among you. May Allah bless us all by His two revelations and enable us to glean benefit from the guidance of His messenger. I say this much and I ask Allah the greatest and most majestic to forgive me, you, and all Muslims for every misdeed. Thus, seek Allah's forgiveness and repent to Him. He is truly the most forgiving, the bestower of mercy. All praise is due to Allah, the owner of all guidance and favor. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped except Allah alone without any partner. Anyone who adheres to his guidance will be protected from harms. I further bear witness that our Prophet Muhammad is Allah's worshipping servant and messenger. He was the best of all who directed people to the most virtuous course. May Allah grant his commendation, protection and blessings to his messenger, as well as to the messenger's family, companions and all who follow their path until the day of recompense. Servants of Allah, continue to observe taqwa of your Lord and remain grateful to him. When someone observes taqwa, Allah protects that person. And when someone is grateful to Allah, he grants that person even more. My dear brothers who have Iman, as our Ummah of Islam seeks a way out of the trials it faces at the present time, it is most fitting for its people to follow in the steps of their messenger, Muhammad. May Allah grant him commendation and protection regarding their loyalty and allegiance. In recent days, the lands of Islam in general and the land of the two holy mosques in particular have been the subject of various hostile campaigns launched over satellite and electronic media. And this emphasizes the obligation we all share to stand as one in order to confront such instances of turmoil and oppose anyone who attempts to attack the lands of Islam or undermine the security of the land of the two holy mosques. May Allah grant them his continued protection. In addition, the sharp-minded youth of our ummah must not be tricked by underhanded tactics of corruption and they must not accept rumors which are spread to achieve sinister motives. All that those methods aim to do is demolish our society, break it apart and undermine its safety and stability. In conclusion, may Allah grant all of you His mercy. Implore Allah to grant His combination of protection to His beloved chosen messenger as well as to the messengers, pure, virtuous, and outstanding family. When someone invokes commendation upon the chosen prophet, once Allah would grant that person commendation 10 times as a result. My Lord, grant your commendation to the prophet for as long as the stars continue to glitter in the darkness of the night and also grant your commendation to all of the Prophet's family and companions who attained the greatest levels 
of virtue. Moreover, Allah Himself said, Indeed, Allah and His angels sent salah upon the Prophet. People of Iman invoke salah upon him and invoke salam upon him as well. O oh Allah, send salah and salam and blessings upon your chosen Prophet and Messenger, whom you made a light of guidance for us, as well as upon his family and his companions, the Muhajireen and Ansar alike, as well as all who follow their path. O oh Allah, be pleased with the Prophet's rightly guided successors, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, as well as all of the companions and the wives of the Prophet and all who follow their path until the day of resurrection. O oh Allah, grant strength to Islam and Muslims. O oh Allah, grant strength to Islam and the Muslims. O oh Allah, grant strength to Islam and the Muslims. Raise the truth and the directives of your religion. O oh Allah, grant us safety in our lands. Guide our authorities and make them people who are righteous. O oh Allah, support our leader, the custodian of the two holy mosques. Guide him to all that you love and are pleased with. Grant him righteous aids who advise him to do what is right and assist him in accomplishing it. O oh Allah, Grant him support by way of his deputy. O oh Allah, guide them to do all that would be best for your servants and their lands. O oh Allah, guide them to do all that will be best for Islam and its people. O oh Allah, rectify the conditions of Muslims in all places. O oh Allah, grant them your care and we call upon you as you are the most merciful of all who show mercy. We beseech you to not leave us to ourselves for even the blink of an eye. O oh Allah, rectify all matters for us. O oh Allah, assist our brothers in Palestine. O oh Allah, assist our brothers in Palestine and the lands of Asham. O oh Allah, rescue Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. O oh Allah, rescue Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa. O oh Allah, rescue Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa from the clutches of the occupiers and aggressors. O oh Allah, Allow it to be a place that is honored until the day of resurrection. O oh Allah, support our brothers in the region of Hashem. O oh Allah, rectify conditions of our brothers in Iraq and Yemen. O oh Allah, allow them and guide them to be people who govern by your book and the son of your prophet. O oh Allah, grant your care to our brothers who are downtrodden in all places, in Burma and in all lands of this world. O oh Allah, none has the right to be worshipped except you. You have no needs, whereas we are in dire need of you. O oh Allah, we implore you to send the rains for us and do not make us among those who are left in despair. O oh Allah, send the rains for us. O oh Allah, send the rains for us. O oh Allah, send the rains for us. O oh Allah, you are the one whose forgiveness we seek. We implore you to send the rains for us. Our Lord, grant us good in this world, grant us good in the hereafter and protect us from the torment of the hellfire. Our Lord, we implore you to accept our deeds and to accept our repentance. O oh Allah, forgive us, our parents and all Muslims, whether alive or deceased. We ask this by your mercy as you are the most merciful. Our Lord is perfect in every way. He grants protection to all of his messengers and all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of all creation.